everybody. Uh, this is our weekly COVID tip session. We are expecting a, a little bit more people than normal because a lot of you got vaccine this week. So remember to just keep yourselves on mute when you're not speaking, and then you can unmute yourself when we get to get to chatting. Um, we have administered 3.4 million vaccines in Arizona as of this morning. It's a really an incredible, incredible number. Um, and we do continue to see a downward trend in the number of cases. We are still at about 842,000 cases that we've had since the beginning of the pandemic. And uh, I do expect next week we will probably reach that 17,000 lost lives mark. Uh, to date, we have 16,977 people in Arizona who lost their life to COVID-19. We are going to have a little bit of a different agenda today because we expect that you have a lot more questions of one another. So we're gonna try and have just a little bit more of a discussion based um, event today. We're gonna talk about immunizing in the office setting. We have two practices that uh, we know are on the line that have been administering vaccines in their office that you can ask questions of, but we know a lot of you are also administering and hope that you speak up. We, at about 12.30, 12.45, Maggie from ADHS is gonna log on the line. Uh, she is our resident ACES expert and works for ACES. So if you have ACES questions, we'll still pause at around 12.45 and just open the discussion up to any other questions, including ACES or billing or whatever we don't get to in the in the discussion time. So not too much has changed since last week, uh, but the, the biggest change is that we have started administering or allocating vaccine to a lot more primary care offices. So a lot of you got at least 100 doses in the last week. We are really excited about that and have really liked helping you all um, you know, through text and email and phone calls, setting up all of your processes. There are still continued supply challenges. So you might not get the amounts that you request still from your counties. And you also might not get the presentation that you request. So if you're really looking for Johnson & Johnson, for example, you might not get that um, presentation. You might instead get Moderna. And as supply becomes more, um, more, you know, once we have more supply, then hopefully you'll be able to start getting what you actually request. We did get an, a couple emails this morning about what's going on with Johnson and Johnson. There, there, we we don't know yet. Um, there has been there was the problem in the storage or in the um, in the facility. So there were some doses that we expect will not be able to be used um, to the tune of 15 million doses. So it's a lot of them. We don't know what the impact that's gonna have if any on Arizona yet. So we'll make sure that we let you know as we find out. And as you're, you're now uh, getting doses, remember to just keep your counties in the loop, especially if you're planning an event like in partnership with a church or a local restaurant or a manufacturing plant where you're going on site just let your counties know they need to monitor what how much vaccine is in each zip code so that they can make sure to prioritize their special events in areas where there's been limited access um, or where there's limited primary care providers because we do have areas throughout the state where that are very medically underserved. So um, they're not gonna tell you what to do or how to do your jobs. You, you've already been approved, onboarded and activated but just keep them in the loop so that they don't go to communities that you're already you're already taken care of. So, so we're gonna we want to make sure that um, you all ask whatever questions are front of mind, especially those of you who are going to be launching your vaccine efforts this week. So please just interrupt everybody and ask questions and share your best practices on the chat. We'll make sure to keep a really close eye on that and ask them if you don't want to speak out loud but we know that there are many of you on the line who are already doing this and we're all doing it for the first time with COVID vaccine. This is very different vaccine. Um, patients view it as very different. It creates a lot of different challenges when interacting with patients. 
So please just share whatever you're learning. So. But I do, we wanted to give a little bit of a kind of set the stage um, of, because we know that there's a, new, a lot of new people on the line. So when we think about vaccine, vaccine delivery, especially for COVID vaccine, there's still, you're still implementing a process, especially when we're thinking about it in the office setting. So you already have workflows for how you do well visits and sick visits and uh, walk-ins. Um, some of you run you know, urgent care-like service lines for your patients. So, so trying to keep our blinders focused just on that COVID vaccine delivery system, you are all already prepared to administer. So you're already onboarded and activated with ADHS to be a COVID-19 pandemic provider. When you did that, you told ADHS that you had all the appropriate equipment, you had the freezers, you had the data loggers. If you were going to transport vaccines, you have those appropriate coolers. And a few days before you get your vaccine, you will receive ancillary kits and that'll have your needles, your swabs, uh, your immunization cards and all of those things. That's something different with COVID-19 vaccine. You hopefully have already trained all your staff in storage and handling of the products that you expect to have in your office. So we expect most primary care and FQHCs will see a lot of Moderna and hopefully a lot of J&J &J as well. So make sure your staff is trained on that everybody's job to do no storage and handling and you've probably already updated your policies and procedures like standing orders um, if there's anything different at registration now or at scheduling and your IT people I'm sure are sick of hearing from you already uh, because you've had lots of questions about interfacing with ACES and EHR templates to help with clinical decision support and all of that. One thing that we're finding some people don't do is really clearly identify staff roles. You need to make sure that there's someone in your office who is really on top of your supply and your reporting. In many practices, the best person for that is not the physician because just of time constraints. And when there's a problem that needs to get fixed, it needs to get fixed now so that you can, you know, immediately so that you can get your next allocation shipped to you. So um, if you are a physician and, and you are overseeing all of that, make sure you have someone who knows everything you know about supply and reporting and somebody who can communicate with your allocator. And then we have, so that's things you've already done. And then with everything that you do in your clinic, you kind of have these four areas of things that happen with everything. You always have a population health management approach. You know what percentage of your patients are in need of whatever service. You always have ongoing staff training. And sometimes that doesn't look like, you know, an in-service with all your MAs, but just during your daily huddle, reminding them, you know, what the temperature needs to be, or that it's everybody's job to look at the freezer when you walk by. Um, if you're doing manual temp logs to know if you see something, um, you have to do something about it. If something's out of whack, you don't just write it down on the sheet and then walk away. We have to actually act or get somebody to act. And then you're in constant communication with your IT and whoever does your policies and procedures. And when we've been thinking about COVID-19 vaccine delivery, we're really thinking about things that have to happen before the patient even comes in the door um, or really even schedules an appointment. There's a group of things that have to happen while they're in the office. And then there's a group of things that happen after they leave. And that's what we're hoping to talk about today. So we hope that you can all share um, how are you identifying patients in need of vaccines still. Uh, we're not going to talk too much about ordering and storage and handling unless you have questions specific about that, especially related to ACES. We'd love to hear how are you scheduling. We've gotten a lot of questions about do you just offer in you know, regularly scheduled visits? Are you doing extended office hours? Are you opening up on Saturday? What's the quickest way to get these vaccines in arms? Uh, we would love to hear today how you've changed your registration and screening process, if at all. Um, the counseling, this vaccine is really different. If you have not started administering this vaccine yet, be prepared because people are super anxious about this shot. Uh, there's a lot of misinformation. There's a lot of panic attacks. 
Um, so counseling is, we're learning more and more about how important that is for this vaccine. Um, and then the last thing that happens when that patient is still in the office is observation and making sure that you have a space in your clinic for them to wait for 15 minutes or 30 if they've had a severe reaction or any allergies. Uh, we know this is super challenging for many clinics because you're, you know, especially primary care, you, those exam rooms are full and there's not very many of them. So would love to hear what you're doing with that. And we talked last week a lot about what happens when the patient leaves, especially around billing and reporting. So, so I'm gonna launch a poll because we'd love to hear which area of this, um, is it this one? Yeah, which areas are you most interested in hearing about today and asking questions about today? So I'll give you a couple minutes to answer that poll. And then we're going to open up and just have people talk. So, but we'll give you a, a full minute for that one. Twenty more seconds here. We have about half of you have answered it already. All right. So I'll share the results. This is interesting because we're kind of all over the map. Uh, lots of questions around reporting. Let's try to save that as much as we can towards the end, because I know that a lot of that will probably have Maggie from ACES will, you know, will want her in on that discussion, but certainly talk about what folks are learning around workflow design and, and chat in all your other things. So, so I'd love it if, sh if, Sherry from um, Internal Medicine Physician Associates is on the line. And I'd love if you could just tell us a little bit about how long you've been vaccinating and what you guys are learning and maybe a little about, about your practice so people can sure. know if they like you or not. Yeah. yeah, so we've been vaccinating from the very beginning. We were one of the first practices to start vaccinating. Um, we also have been testing from the beginning and, you know, this has been, we've been like, like I said, started right from the go ahead at the beginning of this whole process, but, um, we're an internal medicine practice, one physician, we have four nurse practitioners. So, um, we have a pretty like 15,000 patients in our population. So we're pretty busy. Um, we started off pop, uh, vaccinating our 75 and older population, uh, which I will say was a little more challenging. They take a lot more time. Um, we've decided it, our process has changed over this time period. You know, we started off with one idea and then it, it had to change and it had to evolve. So we've kind of gotten to a point now where it works for us. We are seeing, we're vaccinating 20 to 30 patients a day now. We are scheduling the very first vaccine um, as an office visit because what we're finding out is these patients have not been in the office for you know the last year because they've been afraid to go out because of COVID. So they come in and they have a question or you know they have um, you know an ailment or something that they want you to look at. So we've decided that that first appointment is actually a, an appointment where one of our nurse practitioners or our provider goes in really quick. Um, addresses any concerns, answers their questions about the vaccine, tons of questions about the vaccine, you're going to get that. Um, and, and then we give the, and then we administer the vaccine. The second appointment is a, just scheduled with an, a medical assistant. So they're in and out. If they just have to wait the 15 minutes or 30 minutes, depending on what's going on. Um, but we've kind of, like I said, found out that 20 to 30 kind of works for us per day. Um, we were doing 60 at the beginning and it was a little overwhelming because you have 60 vaccines plus your normal patient load. So it gets to be a lot of chaos then for, and you need additional staffing um, and it, it's just more of a challenge. So for a small practice like us, it really works with 
that, you know, kind of that number, um, unless you bring on, like I said, a vaccinator, which then you're looking at cost, you know, you really want to bring on maybe a student or, you know, um, and that's what we have. We have a medical student that's, you know, doing some volunteer hours and she's doing some vaccinating for us, but you know, it, there's a cost involved and the reimbursement is not high. So you have to kind of waive that. We, we did weekend uh, vaccination clinics. It, it actually costs us money to do that. So it did not work for us um, as a practice, because again, the amount of staff that it took to run that clinic um, it was, you know, quite a lot, you know, quite a bit for, um, a very small reimbursement. So, <laughs> so you have to kind of keep that in mind because this is a business as well. You know, you can't, you know, it can't cost you a lot of money to do it, but you also want to vaccinate everybody. So you're kind of looking at it both ways. Like what, you know, you want to do, get everybody vaccinated as quick as you can, but you also can't kill your staff. You also can't, you know, so, um, we also started off trying to do a, uh, electronic where or they would go on and they would do it. Uh, we had a scan barcode. They would go and enter the data. Um, and it was, it was, you know, it was all electronic. Well, your older population can't do that. So we ended up changing and going to paper form. That was the quickest. They fill out a quick little form with all the things that ACES, you know, that they ask for. Uh, we give them their fact sheet. Um, it seems to work quicker, faster. We can kind of get, you know, uh, the patients in and um, it's much easier. Uh, we've also done, you know, our vaccine cards. We do labels. That makes it easier. If you go and buy those clear labels, um, the Avery, they're 18667. That's the number. If you order them, they fit really good onto your little cards. And then you can kind of prep your cards. 25% um, of your people will forget their card though on the second visit. We have two people telling them, um, the vaccinator tells them to bring back their card and the person scheduling their second visit will tell them to bring back their card, but about 25% will still forget their card. So keep track of your patients. So I do it a, a sheet, um, a Google sheet every day of my patients that we vaccinate. And that way my person who's entering it into ACES can log in from home and take care of reporting it for me. Um, but that way I put the lot number on there because when these people come back and if they don't enter it into, if you, you got to make sure your staff is entering it into your EMR, you get that lot number because you'll have to put a sticker, save some of those old stickers to put on their card for them. So that's kind of just like the challenges we've run into <laughs> with doing this whole vaccinating. But like I said, it's evolved, you know, and it kind of what works for your practice and, um, and your staffing, but she's right giving your, your staff roles is important. And I will say a lot of the, the logging, the data logging and the reporting is really kind of been my role. You know, I want to kind of oversee that them to make sure, I mean, that's really important. You don't want to waste those vaccines if that, if your temperature is off on your refrigerator. So definitely have one person in charge of that. Your staff can handle, you know, your MAs will in input the data for the patient into your EMR. Your girls up front will do your normal scheduling. Um, you know, that kind of thing's important. But one thing I will say is for patients that do not have insurance, you want to get their social security number. Then you can get them the uninsured uh, ID number and you can get paid on that, on those claims. So that way you're getting paid on all of the vaccines you're doing. But, and I, I'm sure there's more, but that's all I can think of right now, <laughs> unless you have questions. Yeah, and anyone just feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions, or if you, if you have had a different experience, share that too. Hi, this is Dr. Baker. I, I just wanted to ask a question. You mentioned about getting social security numbers, but uh, what do you do with patients that are undocumented? So when you say they're undocumented, um, you mean they don't have a social security number? That's correct. We have just been doing that out of the goodness of our heart. <laughs> We're still reporting them, but we have not been, um, you know, we, there's nothing we can do because we don't have a social security number to be able to get them an ID number. So we've only had like three of those situations. So we've kind of looked at it like, you know what, if there's, if we're vaccinating, or at least, you know, you, you just kind of do those, we've just been eating it and doing it because we're really the only cost has been for those patients. We schedule them with an MA only. We are not scheduling them with the provider. So we're not taking a provider's time. So we schedule it with an MA, they vaccinate them. And they, we still have all the security stuff there with the, um, our, uh, our anaphylaxis kit and everything is still there. Um, so we 
still, we, we would do, we treat them the same as a second vaccine. So we're not spending a lot of time, but we're um, just doing the vaccine for them. There, there is a, uh, a process to get reimbursed for that. If you reach out to me, I can help you with that. Okay, uh, great. That's, yeah. That's yeah. Yeah, that would be great. And Jennifer, do you want to, do you know that off the top of your head, just for anybody who's listening right now that knows they're going to have those patients tomorrow? Um, yeah, the HRSA program does say that you have to collect a driver's license or a social security number in order to generate the ID. You have to attempt it, but if you can't get it, then they'll still generate an ID for you and reimburse you for the uninsured. Um, and I think there's extra steps in the process. I'll find out from Patty exactly what they are and post them with the chat um, when we're done. Okay. This is Dr. Clark. I don't, I didn't see social, social security number on any of the lists with the modules. Is this something new? Yes, when they set up the HRSA fund to allow for vaccine reimbursement, vaccine administration reimbursement, um, they, they are the ones that require social security. And that didn't come until kind of late in the process, I think in January after we had gotten the vaccine. Um, the other issue that comes up that's so related just, to Social Security. Just so, just so I understand. Yeah. Um, so is HRSA the same as PAN? So HRSA is the federal um, agency that does the reimbursement for COVID testing and COVID vaccine administration for uninsured. Um, so it's a particular program. I'll post the link in it. Um, and it's, it uses the Optum system. So if any of you have, have submitted claims through Optum, um, it's that same process. Um, and if you've already got a, an account, you're fine. If not, you need to get registered uh, with that program to be reimbursed for that. Okay. Then I thought, I thought we were supposed to send all of our billing. We have the vaccine. We're, we're going to um, inoculate on Saturday our first time. So we haven't done billing yet. But I thought we were supposed to run everything um, through the PAN program for being reimbursed unless they have insurance. It, it's the it's the HRSA program. I've not referred I've not heard it referred to as PAN, but it, it's not surprising. There's a thousand acronyms out there. PAN is how you allocate the funding source as you send data to ACES. Um, so it's a funding source because it's a federally supplied vaccine, but you bill it how you ordinarily bill, bill for any of your services through um, insured insurance carriers. Um, if you have uninsured patients, you can't charge them cash. You have to uh, be reimbursed through this other HRSA program. It's a part of the HHS Health and Human Services. It's one of the big grants that came in to pay for COVID vaccine and administration. Oh, new thing to learn about. Thank you. Every day we're learning and we're learning the wrong stuff some days. So we're all in the same boat. <laughs> I'm Jen. This is Kim. I had a quick question. Um, so like you said, we bill the same um, for insured patients. Um, is, does the administration fee also apply for this vaccine or no? You bill the administration fee, you bill zero for the vaccine cost because you received it for free. Um, and then you bill the administration fee. And the good news is, though it had been low in the beginning, um, any shots given after the 15th of March are $40 per dose uh, for vaccine administration. So you bill that to the private insurance. Uh, you bill that to the uninsured program in order to be reimbursed for people without insurance. You bill it to Medicaid. For Medicare, you bill directly to Medicare, not to the Advantage plan. And that's the other issue that's come up with the social security number. Many people don't have their Medicare ID number, especially their new one that they got last year. Um, and so they try to give you the Advantage plan. You can't bill the Advantage plan number. So if they don't know their Medicare ID number, ask for their social security number, you can look it up through, through Medicare. So the administration fee is forty dollars. It is now, hallelujah. Yay. Okay. 
Yeah. One thing I, I was going to mention really quick is um, on that, it, when we sent our claims through, our claims would kick back when we put the uh, the vaccine code on there. So for instance, Moderna, the CPT code is 91301. If we added that on the claim with the, um, sorry, if we add that on the claim with the administration, it was kicking back. So what we did is we've taken, we don't build the CPT code. We only build the administration and the, um, and the modifier is different depending on which insurance you're using. And it seems to pay perfect every time. And we use the Z23 as the diagnosis code. And that's the son, you know, you on the vaccine code, you're supposed to put $0 and then on the administration fee code, you're supposed to put 40. And a lot of the health plan systems, when they see zero, when it goes through the scrub process, it just kicks it right out. So right. if you're having problems with that and you still need to indicate the vaccine, if they're requiring it on the claim, put a one penny on and the claims will usually go through. Some will pay you the penny and some won't. They, yeah, Medicare would pay the penny, but then they would recoup it. So it was like kind of, we just, now we don't even put it on and it pays perfect. We haven't had a problem, but I will say for Blue Cross Blue Shield, Medicare and Aetna, you have to use the SL modifier, but on United, UMR, like Cigna, the COVID uninsured, you don't want to put that SL or it'll deny. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Is and access health plans will deny as well. Mm -hmm. Would that be for all oh, billing? Because uh, hi, my name is Catherine and I'm with NSI, we're um, home health and we have yet to bill, but we had just, we got our first allotment and so uh, still kind of iffy about the billing process. Um, any, I, and we, we take everything, UHC, Mercy Care, all of that. So I'm kind of curious on how that will go and do we have to actually add them into our EMR system and bill out of that? Or is there a way we can do that out of ACES? That's the question. Hmm. ACES I, does not bill, so you can't I, bill through ACES. You have to use okay. your EMR um, okay. or another system that's set up. Okay, that's mm -hmm. what I thought. Thank you. Hi, um, this is Robin Bodeway. I'm the director of nursing at NAU Campus Health Services. And we've been giving vaccines since January. We're actually winding down now and um, um, on the road to no longer giving them. Um, we've had some pretty large clinics over the time. We've given up to 600 vaccines a day. Um, it's kept us really busy. I think we handled it very, very well, but we're finding one of our biggest struggles is um, interacting with ACES. Um, we do not use VFC vaccines ordinarily. Um, and so, you know, my biggest suggestion to people is if you're not familiar to, with ACES, find a way to really sit down and learn how it works. Um, we're struggling right now because all of our inventory is not matching up. We have no vaccines left, yet the ACES inventory says we have about 250 left. And so we're having to go backwards and scramble through charts to see if people documented incorrectly or what might be the problem. Um, so I would just you know, suggest if you're not familiar with ACES, um, it could be a little tricky at first. And there are a lot of subtleties and um, special things I think you need to know for it to operate um, efficiently. So um, take that time because right now it's causing us um, a lot of trouble, even though our clinics went very, very smoothly. Mm. Yeah, that's and to Jennifer's to Jennifer's note about contacting ACES. I I contact them constantly, so um, I annoy the heck out of them because I we don't use ACES, so I really everything's pretty much a question. But no one's really been able to figure out what went wrong. And the last I was told was that I have to account for those doses and I need to go back and find out who got them. And um, that's 6,500 doses that we have to go through one by one by one. Mm -hmm. And um, just some words of wisdom, I guess. That has definitely been our largest struggle. Yeah, that that is really, really helpful, I think, for people to hear. And there's been other comments in the chat thread about you know, one clinic said, if you're doing about 75 to 100 a day, have someone. I'm on, I'm on a webinar. Oh, are you? Uh -huh. 
um, who that's what they do, you know, mm -hmm. is handle ACEs. So I don't know if anybody else would agree with that number. It sounds like Sherry at 20 to 30 a day, you're taking a portion of your time to do it, but you haven't had to bring somebody on to do it. Is that that is correct. When you start going above that, you do need additional staff. You at least in a vaccinator is really what you need. But it's rough on the staff up front because not only are they scheduling, they're getting a million more phone calls because everybody has a question. But then now they have to take set them up as a, a patient because your EMR still requires you to put all that in for the demographics and all the insurance and everything in there. It's super time consuming. So it's more time on your front you know, you're back on everybody. Mm -hmm. So really that 20 to 30 kind of is doable. More than that, it, it, it just starts to get rough without yeah. more staff. And I think too, you have to be a little careful too. I mean, obviously if we're giving 600 vaccines a day, we have about nine or 10 vaccinators. But um, I think the other part of the problem is once you start having too many people involved in the process too, you have to be very, very careful because people make mistakes or they don't do things the same way. So it's kind of a really fine balance um, is what I've found. Yeah, that's a, that's a huge tip too. And you know, we, and like you said, ADHS is there to help you and support you. I mean, they, they will spend the time, but we know that especially as COVID-19 vaccine rolls out, there are a lot of people who have not worked with ACES before, just like Robin's saying, um, and they're really busy. And I'm sure you've experienced, you know, longer hold times and wait times than normal. We have started this, eight, you know, in an effort to try and take some of the knowledge of um, practices who are familiar with ACES, be able to share that with each other. We've started this ACES user group. And Jen, are they meeting regularly or? We, we met once this week for the first time just to kind of get an idea of if it will be helpful for people. And it's a combination of VSD users and um, COVID-19 users. So some old, you know, older um, accounts that have been using ACEs for a long time with some expertise, kind of pairing up a little bit with some of the new um, COVID-19 providers, but similar issues. So we're going to continue to meet and set up a listserv so the group can exchange information and help troubleshoot as things come up. Because you know it's hard to remember a week later what problems you were having um, as you were entering. So that'll be going out uh, the end of this week, I guess, which is tomorrow. My, and I just do have one slides. question. I do have one question. Once we stop giving vaccines, even though we're still um, considered a provider, but we're no longer giving them out, do we still have to do the daily surveys every day with our quantities and how many clinics we have scheduled, which would be zero? Are we still required to keep doing that? That ended today. If you go, if you go to log in to report, it's going to tell you it's no longer there. Really? So yes, today oh, is the last nice. day. I was like, yay! <laughs> well, there are two reports um, that have to go in. Can you clarify that? Yeah, like, this is Angela with ADHS. If you don't mind, I'm going to clarify that. So the the executive order survey ended and the executive order survey is the one where you would put the appointment capacity and the appointments that were scheduled yeah. that has ended if you do go to log in like um, sherry said you should see um, a note on there with the new executive order that re that um, dissolved that survey um, there is another data requirement from CDC Vaccine Finder where you enter your daily inventory into CDC Vaccine Finder and that is still required. Um, and then of course, documenting the doses in ACES and accounting for them in ACES is also still required. So I just wanna make that caveat because there's a lot of requirements and wanna make sure that you know which one is still required and which one is not. Thank you. Thanks. So this is not a question. Or could I, could I just do a, a, a question about what was just said? So which one has stopped? Because I think I had to do one, the one you say stopped, I had to do this morning. So the one that says, you know, capacities and the one, and you put how many appointments you have and then um, how many you've already scheduled and how many are available, that is no longer needing to be done. Correct. That is, that is the one that just stopped on the 
And now keep in mind that some counties have extra surveys. So if it's a county survey where the county is gathering that information from you so that the county can decide how many doses to allocate to you, then if the county's requiring that of you, you would still need to input that into the county survey. But the executive order survey, the governor's survey, that one has now ended. And I don't know if it's helpful for me to send Rebecca a screenshot of the one I'm talking about that ended. That way we're all on the same page. Would that be helpful? Yes. Rebecca, can I do that? Is that okay? That'd be great. Thanks. Thanks. Because I went on that one this morning and it took my data and then sent me a letter saying that it had received the lit. Do you mind forwarding me the email so I can troubleshoot that? I did not mind. Uh, could you post where you want me to yes. send it? For sure, I'll put it in the chat box. My name's Angela Rhodes. Um, hi, so I have a question. Um, so we receive um, our inventory from Her the Her HRSA program, and I know they have their own portal to report, but um, do we still need to add it to the inventory in ACES? Um, because when it's um, documented in our EMR, it does send to ACES, but it's not all full filled out. So it sounds like you're, are you at an FQHC? A federally qualified health center, Kimberly? Yes. Okay. Yes. So this is for federal vaccine, federally allocated vaccine. So for private uh -huh. offices who might be confused, you, that's just for our federally qualified health centers. And do you know the answer to that, Jen, or anybody else who's at an FQ? Do you know the answer to that? I think last week we heard one of the other FQs had said, you in your EHR, mark the federal doses as private, not public or pan, so that when it gets sent to ACES for the record, patient record goes to ACES, but it doesn't decrement off of your state supplied inventory if you mark it as private just for the federal doses. Okay. Does anybody so, else know? I, this is Angela again. I can speak to that a little bit. So you're not, so for federal doses that you receive, you're not required to go quote, enter in your inventory, like in the inventory screen but you are still required to report the doses that were administered. If you choose, because some people just like to choose to enter the inventory in the ACES inventory screen just for their own um, Keeping the organization purposes. Mm -hmm. So if you choose to enter your federal doses into your ACES inventory, they will go in as private. Okay. And then you would just wanna make sure that when you send that HL7 message, to document the administration of the vaccines that you also send those as quote private that way they decrement from your private inventory so okay and, and i like that rebecca clarified earlier that um this is only for the federal doses that are through that hrsa program hrsa program um the bulk of you on this call are probably getting your doses through um, allocated through the county health department that are the, and those are considered pandemic doses. And so it's PAN instead of private. Um, feel free to clarify. So are those the one that, ones that the county approves and went to CDC and then somebody in uh, all of something or another send, ships it out to you? Is the, that ones how that, the, the ones that you're describing where the county allocates it and then the state approves it and it goes to CDC, those are the pandemic doses. Those are, I guess we could call them state doses, even though they're really not state, but they're not through that federal part. They're not through the federal partnership with HRSA. And then what do we call the ones that we'll be ordering through ACES? Those would also be the pandemic doses, um, or the state doses. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm wondering if there were, if anybody has, it's about 1240 now. And I know that the, uh, there's a, sounds to be a lot of questions about ACES and reporting, but I want to make sure that we get any immediate questions that you all have 
around the workflow or scheduling? Is there anything else that you want feedback on specific to that? Scheduling. This is Dr. Clark again. Um, so my understanding could be wrong, but it is that once we get our event or events posted on the uh, vaccine finder, then that opens up um, an appointment scheduler. Is that true? Or do we have to provide our own way of setting up appointments? Um, In vaccine finder, you can do one or the other. You can either put post your doses used in a closed clinic for your patients, or you can post your clinic as an open community clinic um, where they can sign up. But I think you have to provide a, an addre a registration address you know, to your EMR or the system that you use or calling your office, um, unless you're using the state vaccine management system, which is different. That's the VMS? Yes. Mm -hmm. So we are not using the VMS. I have been working for over 24 hours to get set up um, on the locator fine. I filled out the form. Uh, every hour I go back to see if we're listed and we're not. We're getting a little nervous because the event's coming up. Um, and so I haven't been able to test out. We want it open to everybody. We, we, you know, we want people to show up. Um, so is there somebody I can talk to that can walk me through this? Um, what are you in Maricopa County? I am. I wonder if um, have you been working with anyone at Maricopa County Public Health? I've been emailing with several people. Seems like the list goes on and on. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, let's see. Maybe afterwards we'll send a few emails to see if there's anything folks can do to help. But I think that you are. Are you doing a community an event open in the community? At a church, and At we're going to repeat it. Okay. So it's um, two days a week. Um, so if I, I can try, I'm in meetings right after this until two, but I'll try and get a hold of you. If you want to private chat me your phone number, I'll get a hold of you at two and I'll I can see if I have can do help. Hey, I'll jump in there. This is Renee. I we're actually a fire department, and I will I you probably don't want to hear this, but be prepared that you'll be doing your own registration. I know we had to do for our first couple ones and then we were able to get help with the county and we're in Maricopa County. Thanks, Renee. So Rebecca, so I just wanna make sure people show up. Right. And so we're depending on the, the vaccine finder appointment system to let us know people are coming. <laughs> right. Yeah, let, I'll, I'll um, I think I'll, I'll be sure to follow up with you this afternoon. Okay. Yeah. Otherwise I won't sleep. Don't worry, you'll have a line. One thing I would, I would say is, oh, sorry. One thing I would say is because the doses are specific to how many you might have, it's always good to have a few people on a list that you can call at the end of the day, especially for your outreach clinics, because you get 11 doses. I've gotten 12 doses out of those vials and I am a, I hate to waste vaccine. So it's good if you're right. doing clinics where you're going somewhere to have a laundry list of, you know, at, at least 10 people, because possibly you might have to break into that last vial for, one more dose and then you're there and you have nine doses at least that you just hate to waste. So I would say always have someone on a, on a ticker tape that you can call in and get those doses delivered in an arm. So Jennifer, how do you transport from refrigerator? We're gonna be outside. So how do you transport from the refrigerator inside the building um, out to the car? We, um, we transport the vaccine uh, with a data logger and we take it in our cooler and we keep the temperature at 40 degrees for clinics. That's why it's so important to have the doses that you need 
and some people on your list. Um, we had people sign up ahead of time, of course, and of course we had people not show up from time to time. So those people on our list, really, uh, we were able to deliver almost every single dose of the vaccine and not waste any. So you would break up uh, one vial, do 10 syringes, mm -hmm. and then you'd put those in your um, um, cooler, Mm -hmm. And then you would bring that out to one of the stations mm -hmm. and they would just, so how many stations did you have going? We had as many as four um, and as few as one. <laughs> so you could have potentially 40 syringes out there. Um, well, you know, technically speaking, you should have um, somebody that is managing the vaccine to draw and not get too far ahead of yourself. Um, you know, we had a, our largest clinic was uh, just right about 200 people uh, with three vaccinators. And we just drew as we needed because 16 of those people one day didn't show up. And uh -huh. That would have been heartbreaking for me. And don't forget, it's stable at room temperature, even a cracked vial for up to six hours. So we would often bring that vaccine back to our office and that list that we had, we'd say, hey, get, get over here right now. We started in January as well. So we were kind of, we were kind of a hot commodity for a little while. And um, we, it, it was, people were very appreciative to receive yes a vaccine dose that they technically weren't in that phase yet, but we didn't want to waste it. And nobody had came and arrested your physician? No. <laughs> no, they didn't. No. It's a pandemic. It's, it's, you know, don't waste the vaccine. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I know that I see there's a lot of questions and I think Jennifer is starting to try, kind of try and go through and answer them now, it looks like, so that we can try and get those immediate questions answered. Uh, does anybody else have anything that they want to make sure that they share? Like if you've already been doing this and you want to tell these new providers, uh, we've heard ACES is going to take longer than you think, so make sure that you're well staffed to do that. We heard some things around uh, ratios, like if you're doing over 75 a day, you probably want someone who that's, that's what they're dedicated to do. Um, we're going to get to those social security answers in the chat log. Uh, anything else that you want to make sure you would tell a new provider who's opening their doors? So the best advice I got from ACES when we were doing our reporting, because we're manually doing our reporting to ACES every night. And my daughter, I actually hired her part time to do it because our EMR is not capable of doing it yet, is to set up a mass immunization. That way you don't have to put all the data in for each person. If you set it up as a mass immunization, then you're just entering the patients and it's so much faster and that's a lifesaver. That's a good tip. I know there's a lot of a lot of people are doing planning to do manual entries. So. Anything else you want to make sure that you share with folks who are about to start? I have a thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, when you are ordering your vaccine, plan on including not just it asks you for how many doses you have that you're going to use that week. I would go beyond that and go to at least Wednesday of the next week because you may not get your allocations. Your allocations may be cut down. You may have a snowstorm back east and your vaccine sitting in a truck somewhere for longer than planned. That vaccine, you'll usually get your kid on Monday. But a lot of times that vaccine doesn't ship until Monday. So if it's coming from a long ways, it may be Wednesday before you get it. And you'll get an email that says your vaccine is on the way, but it may be Tuesday afternoon. And you're like, ah, I have 10 doses left tomorrow and I have 100 people booked for a clinic. And so be generous with yourself when you're estimating those numbers of doses. 
Yeah, that's a good tip that that Wednesday day. I mean, we always would recommend you, you know, ask for what you're going to use, but think about it as an eight day cycle in case that comes a day late. Um, that is going to, you know, we, we're approaching tornado season and hurricane season and all that all the whole wor world's weather impacts the supply so or at least the countries. Um, I also want to make sure Maggie is on the line now from ACES, so if we have ACES specific questions, but I want to make sure that we speak to, there was a comment in the chat about um, what are we doing with individuals who aren't comfortable sharing um, names and addresses and social security numbers, especially if they're undocumented and don't have their social security numbers. I think that that is something that we really um, are continuing to learn about. It's just not normal that we require uh, that we providers have to ask for a social security number, um, especially providers who are used to working in these communities. So we will make sure uh, when we get to talking about counseling, um, maybe bring in somebody who works with our hard to reach populations oh. about how they're approaching that. I think there is an effort a grassroots effort to make sure that all individuals know that getting your vaccine is safe, it's confidential, and we we don't want to put barriers up. So we'll get we'll get there, I think. And if you have tips now about how to combat hesitancy in that population, throw them in the chat. So let's we'll we'll oh and before we move to our open forum, let me I have an ACES question. Oh good. Go for, so, I think you can open it up to all those ACES questions now. Okay, so um, I want to know if a ACES is um, interfacing with Office Ally. Maggie, do you know that? No, I wouldn't know that. They would have to actually submit the interest form and then um, we could go from there. But it would, um, as long as they can submit a 2.51 message from their EHR, um, they're pretty much compatible with ACEs. Okay. You so your EHR vendor would have to communicate with us and fill out all that required information. And from there, we would go on and see if they are compatible with ACEs or not. Okay. It, it takes months to get that set up. I've been working since December to get mine set up with eClinical Works. So if you if you're not set up now, then you know plan your workflows. Make sure you have a good one for manual entry, and then ADHS and and you know they'll continue working with your EHR too. Thank you. Anybody else have other questions? Jennifer, this is Lori with with the Public Health Department. Um, I think it's really important to reiterate that you have a backup plan. We had a program last week and we had quite a few no shows and we struggled to find arms to put the vaccine in. Yeah, so keeping that wait list. Um, other things, we had a, an event that where they had a a lot of extra doses and they, they started calling the churches um, who were able to like really quickly mobilize their, their people, um, restaurants nearby, you know, think about businesses too and where people already are and just have them come on down if they're comfortable. A lot of those, um, you know, frontline worker groups are still struggling to get vaccine too. So they'll jump at the chance and they, They'll give their folk, you know, let their folks leave work sometimes. So we have one question that I think in here, Maggie, how quickly will your order be acknowledged by directional vaccine registry and EMR for eClinical Works is um, adequate reporting? Will it automatically deduct from the allotment? Um, so typically it can take up to three to two to three minutes, depending um, the interface. Sometimes we do ask to allow 48 hours due to the increase of volume of all the HL7 messages coming in. Okay.
And I have those, those screenshots of that report. So let me bring that up. Uh, we'll go from here. So the old survey is the one on the right of the screen here. That is the one that went away. So when you click on that link now, and it sounds like um, some people may have clicked on it before it got, it got turned off, but when you click on it now, it will say that that survey is no longer required. This is the one I did in the mor this morning. You probably just had plans aligning for you, yeah. Okay. Well, since I, I'm unmuted, what do you do if somebody uh, does, has lost their record card and they're presenting for their post 28 day uh, second Moderna? Are you trusting them? Are you? Uh, so best practice would be to look that person up in ACES. Um, everyone's required to put to to put everything in ACES, so they should be in ACES. We do know that in some settings that ha wasn't happening all the time, um, they would just ask like, "Well, where did you get your vaccine?" If they said State Farm, they knew they get it at Pfizer. Now with Johnson and Johnson on the market, we really can't do that anymore. We really should not be doing that anymore. We should look into ACES and get it because there's multiple products. Okay. If, if you're scheduling mass clinics, like you're going to do a clinic at a church or you're going to do a community-based clinic, I would say plan those people, their second dose to be 30 days from that clinic and you tell those people, this is your, you schedule that with them that day. This is your second dose day. This is your second dose clinic. And um, you will have a little better compliance and you have, you know, you know you, those people that you make your list, your roster or whatever, and you can check right on your, your logs to make sure that those are the people that came to the, the correct clinic. They're supposed to come to this one for their second dose. Thank you. And there's a question in the chat about, can we get vaccine cards? You can email um, Jennifer Tinney, Jennifer T at tappy.org and she can get you extra ones, but you should be getting them in your ancillary kit a few days before your vaccine arrives. Um, so there's another question around, I ordered vaccine last week, but haven't heard whether I'm gonna get it. So that you're gonna to have to talk to your county about the exact answer. But Lori, if that person were in Maricopa County, what would the answer be? Do they reorder, do you know, or? Yeah, I would, I would recommend they reorder. Okay. So Joan, if you're in Maricopa County, put in your neck, your, do a reorder. Um, get it in by noon on Wednesday. We are, this is a Maggie question, I think. We are using Redox and when the race is other, it's coming up blank in ACES. Does it map on the text field or the ID? Example, text dash other, there's an example in there. Sorry, let me scroll back down. I was trying to keep up with the questions at the top. Let's see. It's kind of toward, it's from Pamela Oaks. I would have to look at the full message depending how Redex mapped it to ACES. Hi, Maggie, this is Pamela. I also sent you an email with the um, patient ID number. Perfect. So are we in communi uh, communica communicating with each other already via email? Uh, yes. Perfect. And I will go ahead and look into that email and I will reach back out to you. Okay. Thank you, Maggie. You're welcome. And I think Sherry Allison's asking you, how do you enter a mass vaccine in ACES? I think you were the one talk, who talked about that. Yes, I was just responding on that. So first you want to enter in all your vaccinator information, all your facility information. Then you're going to want to make sure your vaccines have been um, accepted into the ACES system once they've been transferred to you so that every, all your information is already there. Then I thought, I'm trying to remember how you do it. Um, you go to facility and I believe, 
let me look at it again. I haven't done it in a while because it's already been done. We, we automatically set ours as va- a mass immunization. So every day it's a mass immunization. So that that whole group of patients that I did that day, that 20 or 30 are in that mass immunization. Um, let me maybe if you can do like screenshots or something, or maybe Maggie has them, but we can get them sent out. That'd be great. Is that the yeah. waiting room function? I don't think Is that's it called it. waiting room. Oh, no? Angela's okay. saying IPO train has a training session on it. So we'll get the link for that and send it out. So it is one o'clock. I, it sounds like people still have extra questions and things. So we'll keep the line open. Um, for those of you who can stay on, you can stay on. I actually have to log off, but Jennifer can handle things. And when you get these slides, it's going to have just a couple tips. We thought in case people don't log on today, um, we'll have some information to share. It just has some couple tips. The only ones I want you to remember is that we have done a stellar job of getting people 65 and over vaccinated in our state, but there are still some people who you know feel more comfortable getting it from their primary care provider. Please recall those patients in there most at risk for severe disease, hospitalization, and death. So if you're doing a clinic in your office, try to call your 65 plus in first. Uh, know that we have resources on our website. You'll get links to those when you see the slides. We have the EUAs on a, you know, a QR code people can use with their phones. We have lots of handouts um, with lots of different people and pictures on them. And we also have things specific about insurance. Uh, some of our providers have asked us to do these handouts so they can hang them in their waiting room. So we have all of those too. Um, and where do we find the slides? Uh, we well, we email it out, I think, right? Do we email it out or how does that work? Nicole? We email the, the link. They go up on the, the link where you are on our website. I'll post it again. Um, and then we post the link to where you can find the recordings, the slides for these, the other ones. And then any materials that get mentioned, we try to find those as well and post them up so it's easy to locate. Yeah. And, um, and if you take that evaluation this time, we were planning on talking about administration and common administration errors, but if you need to talk about something else, just put it on that evaluation, because if we get an overwhelming number of people who say, no, this is what I need to talk about, then we can always adjust and adapt. So, and Jen, I'm going to log off and go talk refugees. So. Okay. Sounds Ready. great. Thank you all for what you're doing. Thank Have you a fun Rebecca. week saving lives. It's your first week having vaccine. Very Thank exciting. You. So I'm on the very ACE exciting. site right now. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say very exciting, but nerve wracking. So yes, yeah. if you're on the ACES website, share what you've got. I was just going to tell you. So on the ACES site, so once you log in to the left, you're going to add in again, your physicians and vaccinators. So you'll put all that information in there. If you open up settings under there, there's facility. So you go onto that and you'll make sure that all your information's, it, it, you know, uh, inputted in there. So like your address, who your vaccinators, all that stuff will go in there and your, your lots will also show up in there. When you actually go to do a mass immunization, you're going to hit on the, on the under main, there's something called select application. When you click that, you have a choice of standard, which you're gonna do them individually, or mass immunization. You're gonna pick that mass immunization. So whoever's inputting your information, if they change that to mass immunization, then when they hit submit, every patient they put in, it's gonna populate that data from your facility and your, your uh, vaccinators onto those patients. So it does it all for you. And it asks for less information if you do it that way. So they do it under main select application is how they'll choose mass immunization. Okay, that's great. Thank you. And then also we've heard too that the state's VMS, that's a vaccine management system, um, is a little bit easier to use than that function in ACES. So if you're hosting an open clinic and you want to post it for people to make an appointment, you can use the state's BMS system. The patient makes the appointment in there. You have a back end view of it where you put in the doses that were given and then it automatically connects to ACES. 
So if your EMR isn't connected to ACES and you're doing mass clinics, you might want to consider using the VMS system. Um, and then the problem with that, though, is you are going to have to download that data, get it into your practice management system in order to bill for it. So, you know, kind of either way, you're going to be working out of two systems for a little bit until you're connected. Okay, are there any other questions that we either missed in the chat or that just kind of came to you that you want to get a quick answer to? Trying to scroll through here. Um, the other thing that we do is we'll spend the afternoon trying to collect all the questions from the chat and trying to track down the answers or tips that other people shared on, and we'll put those into a document that we can attach to an email that we'll send out to you after. So hopefully we'll be able to capture everything. If we didn't answer something, we'll try to follow up um, either with you or with everyone and get it posted for you. I have a really quick question. This is Dr. McMahon in Tucson. What, when you give a, the information sheet, the fact sheet, is that a standard form like from CDC? Uh, yes, so typically you would give what we call the BIS or vaccine information statement for these because they are they are in an emergency use. It's called an, an, an emergency use um, sheet. So we've got links to all of those. I'll get those posted as well, but you are supposed to give them to each patient. It's almost like a package insert that you get with any prescription that, you know, it tells the patient what to expect. Um, how the vaccine was made, any any information that they need for follow-up. Oh, there you go. There's a... Yes, Sherry, that's you. what I was looking for. Yes. There it and is. that's just a standard form from the CDC? Yes. We just downloaded it and made a ton of copies. <laughs> Thank you. The other thing that we have postcards on our website, um, we have postcards and a poster that has links to uh, for patients to go to to download their own EUA or to read it online. And it also tells them what to expect after the shot and then how to um, sign up for the CDC's Be Safe app. So instead of printing all the copies, especially if you're doing big clinics, if you wanna just hand them postcards um, and ask them to follow up with that, it kind of gives them some instructions to download um, the information about the vaccine uh, from there. So there's posters and postcards. If you wanna order those, they're free as well. So somebody's asking if anyone uses NextGen. I think we have a lot of NextGen users. I'll see if we can connect you to some NextGen users. For the next question coming in, how do you get the postcards? They're on our website at yimmunize.org under free materials. You can order them there if you need them quickly. Um, we can try to get some bundled and left at our front office to pick up, or if somebody is in and out of our office, we might even be able to drop them off depending on where you are. Um, if not, we'll mail them to you and get them to you as quickly as we can. Maggie, we have a question about where you add vaccinators and ACEs. Yes, it's located on the left-hand side. Let me just make sure I log in and remember how to... And it says physicians and vaccinators is the yep. blue tab. And you go search and add, and then you would enter the name. You would select the add button and enter in the information. And if you need uh, steps by steps, um, please enter your email in the chat and I can go ahead and send that directly to you. Okay, any any last questions hanging out there? I so Sounds appreciate like you all down. doing this. Oh, we appreciate you guys. You're sharing more information with us every week than we're finding everywhere else. So we're learning as we go and 
and we hope that it's helpful. And please let us know, you know, what topics or things you want to cover or dive deep into. We can do that as well. All right. Thank you all so much. And thank you for sharing all of your tips and tricks on how you're getting through this. Um, but it's, you know, it's exciting. It is. It's very exciting. Thank you. We'll see you next week.